On October 2, 1916, Frances Cluett received a telegram. Its four words would forever change her life. Expect you this week, it said. Cluett had been accepted into the Voluntary Aid Detachment. She was on her way to St. John's to begin her training. The Voluntary Aid Detachment was a unit of semi-trained nurses who served in Europe during the First World War. VADs, as they were called, worked in dangerous, war-torn places like France and Turkey, where they received badly wounded soldiers from the front lines. They were flexible workers who did whatever was needed. They drove ambulances, cleaned hospital wards, prepared and served meals, sterilized medical equipment, bandaged wounds, bathed patients, made their beds, and prepared their meals. It was a big step for a small-town woman. Frances Cluett, or Fanny as everyone called her, was born and raised in the fishing community of Ballorum on Newfoundland's south coast. She came from a family of fish merchants and was descended from some of the area's earliest settlers, like John Cluett, who built Ballorum's first school in the 1830s. Fanny Cluett also proved to be a community leader. Before she went overseas, she was a school teacher. She also took a leading role in local community and church groups. When the war broke out, Cluett became president of the Ballorum branch of the Women's Patriotic Association. It was an island-wide, volunteer organization that made significant contributions to the war effort. Its volunteers raised tens of thousands of dollars and sent shipment after shipment of desperately needed food, clothing, and other supplies to troops overseas. But Cluett wasn't content to simply send care packages to Europe. She wanted to go there herself. In 1916, the 33-year-old decided to join the Voluntary Aid Detachment. Over the next four years, Cluett compiled a wealth of letters and photographs that today give us an important eyewitness account of Europe during the war. But the first step in her wartime service was a trip to St. John's to complete about four weeks of training. She wrote about her experiences in frequent letters to her family in Ballorum. Dear Mother, I arrived at St. John's Friday around 2 p.m. Wasn't a bit seasick coming, no more than on land. At 8 p.m., Mrs. Browning took me down to British Hall to the lecture room. I was just a little late. There were seven girls already there. Dr. Reeves lectured to us, then we had to apply bandages ourselves. I got an introduction to a Miss James, so I applied bandages on her. Mrs. Browning and the doctor looking on. The first bandage went around the arm and body. Second fracture we had to splint the arm, and bandage, also put in a sling. Third bandage was around the elbow, fourth bandage around the forearm, the last one around the hand. The VADs studied first aid, home nursing, and hygiene. They also volunteered in hospitals where they took patients' temperatures, brought them meals, and performed other tasks. Open-air drills also taught them how to build and cook on campfires, how to pitch hospital tents, and how to care for wounded soldiers. By the time Cluett joined the Voluntary Aid Detachment in 1916, there was an urgent need for nurses overseas. Europe's casualty hospitals were chronically understaffed and medical personnel were overwhelmed by the thousands of wounded soldiers who kept pouring in from the front lines. The Voluntary Aid Detachment decided to cut its training program from about seven weeks to four so it could send more people overseas. Cluett took her exams on October 29th. A few days later, she was on her way to Europe. After a brief stay in New York and then London, she was assigned to the 4th Northern General Hospital in Lincoln, England. The facility received convoy after convoy of wounded soldiers from the front lines. Young men with gunshot wounds, missing limbs, and terrible injuries. It was a shocking introduction to the brutality of war for Francis Cluett. The fifth day when I was helping sister with the dressings, I fainted away. When I came to myself, I was stretched out on the floor. I tell you, I have seen some horrible wounds. I often have to turn my head and look out through the window. It was a different world from the fishing community of Ballorum, where Cluett had spent almost all of her life. From her bedroom window at night, Cluett now watched searchlights strobing the sky, trying to pinpoint the German zeppelins that sometimes bombed the area. There were other, less dangerous signs of the war, too. Oh, mother, we are put on rations. 
A two pound loaf of bread must last us two days. And we are also given three quarters of a pound of sugar to do us for a week. It is laughable. Many a time since we have been rationed out. The other evening I went down to the dining room for my tea at 5 p.m. and all the bread I had was just a little bit of crust. So I put that in the corner of my coat pocket. We are so hungry sometimes. But Cluett soon adjusted to the hardships of life in a war zone and to the chaos of working in a casualty hospital. She turned out to be a resilient, kind-hearted, and skilled worker who cared tirelessly for the injured men filling up her wards. Groves has had to undergo another operation. I hear there are talks of sending him to his home in Canada. This morning, Sister was syringing his leg. Then she put plugging into it. Plugging is put on one side of the leg and pulled through the other side. It is awful. Goswell is able to hop around the ward. I expect he will soon be sent to his home in London. He went yesterday downtown to Theatre Royale. It seems so nice to see these poor things able to get up again. Four have died in Gillyshaw's ward. In April 1917, Cluett was ordered to a military hospital in France. After only five months in England, she was going to a place dangerously close to the front lines. The rapid promotion was a testament to her skill, but it was also a symptom of the medical crisis facing Allied forces. When the war began, only the most experienced VADs were stationed near the front lines. Now, rookies were being shipped off to the overtaxed and understaffed war zone hospitals. Cluett and all of the VADs had to take on work that was better suited to professional nurses. But in the chaos of war, everyone had to rise far above their training and their fears. Dear Lil, this afternoon I was on alone. I had to bathe the eyes of five men who were gassed, and that takes a bit of time. I then had to give four inhalations of boiling water and friar's balsam for gassed throats. I had to put a perchloride dressing of gauze and wool on a man's thigh, and had to powder a gassed burnt back, which was simply awful. You told me before I left I should never stand the work. I remember hearing you say about staying in the ward with the dead. Ah, Lil, many a bedside have I stood by and watched the last breath with the rats rushing underneath the bed in groups, and the lights darkened. I do not dwell on some of the horrible and terrible sights I have witnessed. On November 26, 1917, the war affected Cluett in a very personal way. On that day, her cousin, Lieutenant Vincent Cluett of the Newfoundland Regiment, died from the wounds he received in battle five days earlier. He was 21 years old. I used to think that perhaps Vince and I would spend our vacation together. I think of him when I see the drafts go up the line headed by the officers. I knew when he was sick that he must be more than slightly wounded, as he never once wrote me. Otherwise I should have had a very long letter. It was the Battle of Cambrai he was wounded in. All our boys got knocked out. Gas was used a lot. Poor Vince's wound was gassed as well. I cannot for a minute realize that he is dead. In the middle of all that pain and misery, Cluett's letters home were a lifeline, a connection to a familiar and a safe world and to the people she loved. She wrote often and she anxiously awaited news from home. But even better than a postcard or a letter was the occasional parcel that made it to military hospitals. It took them weeks to arrive and not everything survived the trip. I got the cake parcel, but sad to say the cakes were mixed together as one and beaten to pieces just like sawdust. First looking into the box, you would really think it was a box of sawdust, but of course it tasted quite differently. I am more than thankful to you, Mother, for sending them. I was so glad of the sugar, for one cannot buy an ounce for love or money. I have a tin of cocoa in my room that one of the patients gave me, and almost every night before I go to bed I have a cup of it, but without sweetness. So, Mother, that sugar is like gold to me. One has almost to count the grains before using it. As the war stretched on, it took a heavy toll on Cluett. Her letters were sometimes despondent, and she seemed to sense that a divide now separated her from her friends and family back home. 
people who had not seen the violence of war and who could not relate to her life-changing experiences overseas. March 31, 1918. We are awfully busy, nearly killed since this last rush. If this war does not soon end, there won't be a man living on the face of the earth. It is brutal, it is cold-blooded murder, it is hell upon earth. Ah, if you could only see and go through what we do, mother, it is enough to drive one mad. In they come, stretcher after stretcher. Oh my, their clothes have to be cut off, shirts, pants, and everything. Such a state of blood and mud. They are then bathed, and one has to handle them very, very carefully, especially if he is shot in the head. No head case is allowed to sit up at all. Some of them can't see at all, all smashed to pieces. One poor, poor boy, lying day after day with eyes bandaged. Think of them, blind for life, and so young. That letter was one of the darkest that Cluett sent home but it also revealed her extraordinary strength of spirit because she ended it with these words, nothing would induce me to give it up. After that, there is an eight month gap in Cluett's correspondence. Her letters may have been destroyed or lost, or perhaps Cluett was so busy during the final months of the war that she had no time to write. She resurfaces on November 2nd, 1918. In a brief postcard to her mother, Cluett reveals that she is on leave near Italy, enjoying a much-needed period of rest. Nine days later, the fighting finally ended. After the war, Cluett stayed in France for a few more months nursing wounded German soldiers. Then she was ordered to Turkey. On the way, she stopped off in London to attend the Victory March on July 19, 1919. Oh, mother, the cheering! You cannot realize what it was like. The splendor of their dresses, flags innumerable. London was decorated beyond description. A monument was erected at Whitehall in memory of the fallen. Pall Mall was elaborately done. Buckingham Palace aglow with flags. Cluett spent about a year in Turkey before she finally returned home to Newfoundland. Her final letter to her mother was dated November 21st, 1920. It ended on a happy note with Cluett looking forward to the simple pleasures of home. Goodbye, Mother. I am dying for a home meal. See you very soon. Your loving daughter, Fanny. Frances Cluett worked for many years as a teacher in Ballorum. She also ran a small general store and became a well-loved community leader. She lived a long life and she died in 1969 at the age of 86. The wealth of letters and photographs that Cluett left behind provide us with a window into an important chapter of our past. They record what life was like for the people who went overseas in the First World War. We also see how one woman from Newfoundland bravely responded to the call to duty and how she pushed herself beyond all previous expectations that she and her family may have had of her courage, her strength, and her compassion. <laughs>